You're listening to The Treasure Cast, a production of Woodridge Community Church. The Treasure Cast exists to help the church treasure Christ above all as we bring God's truth to bear on a wide range of topics in Christianity and the world around us. We pray that you are encouraged by the episodes you find here. Now for today's episode. Hello, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you happen to be and whatever time you happen to be watching this, welcome to the Treasure Cast. Uh, My name is John Fannerstill, he is Drew Hacker, and we're here with Pastor Matt Jans and Pastor Matt Erdman today. And uh, Matt uh, Erdman evidently is uh, the first guy, it's his first time here, he does not have a sport coat, and uh, we'll rectify that Matt's for next one time. This time though. Matt has got one on this time, though, and we're very glad to see that he <laughs> has gotten with the program here. It, it might just be for this time, we'll see. <laughs> this He's going to take it off halfway through. Yeah. I, I am a faithful viewer of the Treasure Cast, and so it is to my shame that I forgot to bring a jacket. <laughs> it is. It really but is. I will treat it as a, a graduation event. Next time, there your second go. appearance on That's the right. pod. Second appearance, you're going to be all ready over to suit up. He's going to have a full suit We're up ready up. to go. Hi. Everything. Well, today, today on the Treasure Cast, we're going to be talking about happy Calvinism and I- exactly what that is. And we're, we're, we've come prepared. We've got uh, guys here who have studied this and uh, know what they're talking about. I have my John Calvin coffee mug here, so I am prepared. And Drew has brought <laughs> books. We yeah, even we have books, books here today. That's right. And uh, so if we need to reference those, we'll be able to do that. But, but what we want to talk about today is happy Calvinism. And I think before we get any further into that, um, why don't we just define Calvinism? What is Calvinism? Let's talk about that for a minute, guys. Yeah, I think, you know, Calvinism is, is oftentimes narrowly kind of described um, as like just five points um, that represent um, how God saves people you know, how God works in salvation. And that's really just a really brief, um, simplistic definition for really what it is. Um, But it can go so much deeper. (laughs) Yeah, it it absolutely can. And we're obviously not going to have time to get into everything associated with Calvinism and all the implications. And then you you get into the broader context of Reformed theology, which a lot of people would say that the, the word Calvinism is a sect of that. And Um, specific to uh, the doctrines surrounding salvation and so you know with with Calvinism where what what comes to mind for a lot of people is the is the acronym TULIP total depravity unconditional election limited atonement irresistible grace and perseverance of the saints and so um, you know for for our purposes uh, on the podcast we're not going to get to get into necessarily all of that uh, this time but that's where that's where my mind goes. Yeah, I think of two. One aspect of Calvinism, as we talk about it with respect to uh, salvation, is also the very God-centered focus of it. Mm. So even within those points that you offered, the points of the tulip, what we essentially have is a description of how uh, God in. Uh, glorifying and magnifying his godness chooses to display the depth of his character throughout time in the salvation of, of his people. So we have the fact that those God has chosen to save since before the foundation of the world are those who end up there at the uh, the close of, of the world uh, and the, the new world and the new creation. Mm-hmm. And, and so God's working in time to take his plan from point A to point Z is what we're talking about uh, when it comes to, to Calvinism, and that is a very uh, God-centric plan that has a lot of uh, weight for us to, to hang our joy upon. Yeah, I taught, a, I taught a Sunday school class, and it's probably been like maybe three years at this point, um, and so we probably need to have another class on that mm-hmm. soon or, or uh, reform Theology 2.0. But... Um, you know, when, when you're thinking about that, that is that is at the heart of Calvinism, is that God centrality. And I think that that's what draws out what we're going to talk about 
in the episode uh, today is um, the the joy that we get to experience or the happiness and I'm gonna I'm gonna probably say joy more than even the word happiness as we Fair go enough. through as we go through the episode but the joy that we experience when our uh, understanding of these things is God central rather than man central and and that plays a huge role into uh, how we view some of these things and the reason that we can be joyful as Calvinist because everything is is God centered and I think how how that ties into our church too is you know um, and we'll talk about this as we go but we're we're happy about this we're joyful about this doctrine Absolutely. we're not sad about it you know people aren't walking into our church why are all these people so sad and depressed it's like no we're actually really joyful in our Calvinism yeah. is happy. that an issue where where some some Calvinistic churches are yeah because I've I've wondered about that you know we're talking about happy Calvinism. That implies that it kind of has a reputation for being kind of... The frozen chosen. Yeah, you know, that's right. Just, I mean, <laughs> da, 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 you know? What, where, do, where, where is that coming from? Yeah, I, th I think there is a real, there is a real, like, connotation that's associated with Calvinism at times. Um, and we were talking about this earlier in the, in the week when I stopped in in the office mm -hmm. about um, just the the intellectual aspect of um, the doctrines of grace or, or Calvinism sometimes overshadows the, the outpouring or the outworking of that in our heart. And so Calvinism oftentimes is associated with the theological points, which is headnology points. Right. And when, when people are working through those, um, there can there can often be this disconnect between uh, the heart transformation or the heart effects of the doctrine that we are talking about because it can become a very intellectual conversation. And so I think that's where some of the connotations come from, where people think that Calvinists are not joyful people because they tend to be in the nitty gritty details studious, of the truth right, and serious yeah very not so much unhappy as much as serious mm. the very serious yeah and we can be joyful mm. absolutely and because because these doctrines do bring about joy yeah now now calvinism you know i, I i'm thinking back here now to uh my wife and i have some friends uh, from out of town and they came into town and we were having lunch with them and it we got onto the subject of this and uh, I told them that uh, we're coming from a Calvinistic viewpoint. And it was like I had told this woman that I'm a serial killer. <laughs> she looked at me like, you, you're, you're a Calvinist? Like it was some horrible, horrible thing. Um, it seems to have a reputation for being controversial. Mm. Why do you think that is? Well, I would... I would say one of the one of the big issues, first of all, is people don't understand when when we talk about uh, you know go through the acronym tulip when we talk about total depravity or unconditional election and we start to unpack what we mean by those things. I think it's very easy in unpacking those things for people to look at them. Uh, from a negative perspective. Mm. So if God, before the foundation of the world, chooses all who would believe in him, then that must mean nobody really has any freedom. So free will is a big issue. Mm -hmm. um, nobody has freedom. We're all robots. We're all, and so it instantly goes to this like negative understanding of the doctrine. Um, whereas if you, if you really start to unpack it and, and think through it a little bit more deeply, um, you see the God-centered, which should be a positive for you mm -hmm. uh, aspect of, of each of these doctrines. Yeah, I think, too, what becomes a real sticking point for people is the fact that the truths of the doctrine of grace, as a, a card-carrying Calvinist would want to present them, um, rest first and foremost on the standard of God's word as he has breathed it out for us to, to know him and to understand. And so often the, the, our natural inclination is to uh, judge things and understand them by the standard of our own experience. So um, a, a famous Calvinist, John Piper, uh, was not always a Calvinist, and he tells a story of wrestling with this idea in seminary, uh, and, and the 
professor who was a Calvinist who was instructing him in these doctrines was talking about the sovereignty of God mm -hmm. and the way that he has uh, ordained and decreed things for his glory. And Piper's retort to him at the time was to, to grab a chalk or a pencil and drop it and say, I dropped it. Because he was taking things that even that had been revealed about God, but he was folding them into how he understood his own experience. Mm. And we run into a lot of trouble when we do that theologically, uh, when we fold what God has revealed about himself and, and incorporate it with our own experience as the final arbiter of how we are to understand okay. it and how we are to make sense of that. Rather, we are to let God be God and speak as he speaks and describe his sovereignty and his quality as he describes them. And so that creates a tension in the life of, 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 of anyone who it's not there. It's not our, our natural inclination um, to let something outside ourselves be the standard of, of judgment. We, we desire to bring it within ourselves and to make ourselves kind of the arbiter of all that is good, right, and true. But to be um, someone who has been by the Holy Spirit awakened to the glory of God and the goodness uh, that he reveals in the scripture concerning himself, uh, it is actually in the same way that we, we first had to repent of our sin by the grace of God and say, it is not within myself to save myself. I need a savior and his name is Jesus. Uh, we need to come to a biblical worldview which says, I'm going to let God be the standard of truth and understanding. And I am giving that up in and of myself, even um, if it creates a little bit of tension. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm thinking at, at this point, just in case we have people watching this or listening to this, that are not familiar with the doctrines of grace, aren't familiar with the points of, of the tulip. Um, could we go through those a good and idea. just explain what they are? Because I think we're kind of, in our talking here, we're assuming they know. That's right. And let's not do that. <laughs> I think it would be helpful. So I think, you know, just quickly, you know, you could Google this stuff and you find some decent information. Gotquestions.org has some helpful stuff. You know, we've referenced that in previous episodes. Um, but just, yeah, I'll, I'll tackle just the first one, total depravity, the T of the tulip. Um, you know, basically, as a result of what Adam has done in the Garden of Eden, when Adam sinned, basically the entire human race inherited that sin. We have what's called original sin, mm -hmm. and everyone is born a sinner. Everyone is dead in their trespasses. When I think about what this looks like, um, you know, you imagine, you know, this, there's this analogy of, of how God saves people and, you know, you have the person swimming in and God's just throwing you a life raft and then it's like, oh, he's got to grab the life raft, you know, and, and then he can be saved. It's like, well, no, like the Calvinist believes that that swimmer is on the bottom of the ocean. He is dead and God had to intervene because dead men cannot save themselves. He isn't themselves. capable of he's grabbing any capable life preservers. of that, exactly. Yeah. And so that's the T, that's total depravity. <clears throat> well, these, these all... What you'll notice even as we go through these is these all run um, run hand in hand, right? So the logical conclusion to man being dead is that he has no ability within himself to reach up and grab hold of any sort of life preserver. And and so if you're following that train of thought, then the natural conclusion is that God has to be the one to bring what is dead to life, life mm, right? right? And so we see, you know, one of the one of the passages, pretty pretty prominent passage uh, in Scripture that speaks to this is Ephesians one, uh, starting in verse four. Even as He chose us in Him, be found before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him. In love, He predestined us for adoption to Himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of His will, to the praise of His glorious grace, which He has blessed us in the beloved. So, you know, the the second. Uh, letter of the TULIP acronym is that unconditional election that that because man is dead, God must be, and this is getting back to what uh, Pastor Matt talked about earlier, the God word aspect of uh, Calvinism, that God is the initiator, God is the one who is doing the work, and it is uh, in the midst of our complete and total inability to save ourselves that God chooses who he will save. No. That brings us to the L, which is limited atonement. Throughout the annals of history, other theologians have preferred to uh, refer to it as something like particular redemption. Mm -hmm. And the idea behind this point of uh, the doctrines of grace is that when it comes to the atonement of the Lord Jesus, his 
payment, his standing in the place to receive the wrath of God for sin and, and offer his righteousness to those who believe in him, that that transaction happens for a particular group of people and it does not fail for them. So um, this is often contrasted with a, uh, a universal redemption as opposed to a particular redemption. Um, so what we're asserting is it's not as if uh, the, the blood of Jesus was spilled for all people of all time, even those that uh, were uh, in hell uh, when he went to the cross that day, uh, but rather it was for those God had foreordained before the foundation of the world that would be uh, brought to be worshipers of his son Jesus. Jesus went to the cross specifically for those people, and because he did so, he is able to save to the uttermost. There is no one for whom Christ died that is not saved to the uttermost, as the book of Hebrews says. And so there is this iron-clad plan of God from before the foundation of the world to the end of time, and in the middle of it, in the fullness of time where the cross of Christ exists, it is the, the ironclad accomplishment of salvation for those particular people. So the atonement is limited to those people whom God has chosen. I would, it is not for God. Jesus didn't die for every person that ever lived. I would uh, he died for that. those who were chosen. Yeah, and I and I think before we move on to the next uh, letter in the acronym, <clears throat> I think like when you start to to unpack that, that that's that's where people can say well, let's think about that, and, and when we start to think, that seems unfair, right? Yeah. So instantly, it's become a negative. So under, yep. It's become a negative understanding of the doctrine of limited atonement. But instead, I think when you understand things rightly, you understand how how personal That's right. God's salvation of the elect is. That when he that when Christ died on the cross, he was not dying for this general salvation. He was not dying so that he might throw a, a life raft out into the, the depths of the sea so that anyone who, who might decide to grab hold of it can grab hold of it and be saved. Instead, his death on the cross accomplished in his death, he was dying specifically and personally for those that uh, that he chose to save. And so it, when you think about it that way, it becomes a joyful doctrine. Mm -hmm. It's a personal doctrine. The salvation of God is a personal salvation for all who, uh, who, who he chose before the foundation of the world. And I think it's really good to put some Bible to this because as we talked yes. about with the kind of systematic nature of the doctrines of grace, <coughs> and the logical way which all these doctrines work together, people will often levy the criticism that particularly this limited atonement piece is just a logical consequence of the theological system rather than something that is drawn from the pages right. of scripture. And so if you've been in a membership matters class, and we have taught these classes right. a number of times, John, uh, you will see me going to this passage because when, when everyone loves Romans 8, and when you start talking about Calvinism, people think, oh, you're just going to go right to Romans 9. I was like, no, I can prove it from Romans 8 for you. <laughs> In Romans 8, uh, starting at verse 31, Paul writes this, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? I'll stop there for the first part of this. There is this connection between the giving up of the son and thus the giving of all things. So if you want to assert that Jesus was given up for all people of all time in the exact same way, you would also need to assert that all people of all time are given all things in the exact same way. And particularly as Reformed folk, we believe that faith itself is a, is a gift. Repentance is a gift. And we, in time, even as we weep with, for our own family members who die apart from the Lord, we know that the gift of faith and the gift of repentance is not given to all people of all time. And, and so if he did not spare his own son, how will he not graciously give us all things? So those for whom the Son have been given will receive all things. And we know from the rest of Scripture that that includes being the heir of all things as we reign with Christ in eternity. But it doesn't even stop there. Going on to verse 33, it says, Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. 
So there's this connection between the death of Jesus and the intercession of Jesus. We could probably do a whole other podcast on how that is tied up in his high priestly work. Uh, but what it boils down to is this. There, there, there cannot be a disconnection between the people for whom Jesus died and the people for whom Jesus intercedes. And when we're talking about the intercession that the Lord offers on behalf of his people, it refers to him standing forever next to the Father's side as an internal testament to the fact that his blood counts for those people. So if you are saying that the blood of Jesus counts for all people of all time and he stands next to the Father as a living testament to that, there must be then some people for whom the Father says, no, actually, that's not true. Jesus' intercession would fail in that regard if he is standing next to the Father saying, my blood counts for all people of all time. Jesus' inter intercession does not fail because he stands as a living testimony to the fact that those for whom he spilled his very precious blood, he lives to intercede for them. Yes. And it is the exact same group. His intercession does, does not fail. He is the perfect intercessor. Amen. And that's why even from the pages of scripture, we can see that because of the connection between his death and his intercessory work, it's right there that, that there is a particular group that is blessed to receive those blessings of the Lord. I knew there was a reason we had you on today. <laughs> Other than just his good luck. Other than his good, good luck, too. lack of mustache. Of mustache. mustache. mustache too. <laughs> and that's just the first couple of verses of that section. Yeah, sure. you know, like, and obviously we'll, we'll talk about more later, but it's just it's so loaded. You know, the Apostle Paul does such a good job of, of helping us understand these, these wonderful truths and why one can be joyful as we read them. Yeah. You know, amen. And they can upset people. I've got, I've, before we move on to irresistible grace, I've got a, 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 a can I tell a story? Just a funny little uh, limited atonement story. I've got my <laughs> coffee mug here. Yeah, I don't think we can zoom in on it, but this is uh, from Reformed Coffee Roasters. This really is a thing, and they have um, the coffee that chooses you is their slogan. <laughs> now, we're not doing a commercial here. We aren't getting paid for Reformed this Coffee Roasters. This episode is sponsored, sponsored by... Sponsored by... by no, 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 we're not doing yeah. that. But, but they've got all these different blends. They've got, uh, they've got Perseverance of the Saints blend, Irresistible Grace blend, and I bought... I kind of like a lighter roast, and I bought their Limited Atonement blend. These things do, and we're going to get into this, just spark, spark reactions So many people, people have a, a misunderstanding of yeah. what these doctrines actually represent because oftentimes they're presented with false information about it or they're getting Calvinism confused with other things like yeah. hyper-Calvinism or ivory tower Calvinism or whatever, you know, and so there's... I want to get into that in a yeah. bit about how Calvinism can be mm. mis misused. But mm. limited atonement, can we move on there? We'd we, like to we're tackle good. that. Yeah, I think we're going to no, atonement. I'm Irresistible sorry. grace. Irresistible grace. I'm not <laughs> it's been a long day. Irresistible <laughs> grace. Well, all who the Father, um, uh, you know, John 6.37 talks about this doctrine. All that the Father gives to me will come, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. So it's this, it's this thought of basically, um, you know, those who God has elected from before the foundation of the world um, had, as part of his you know, eternal decree to elect these uh, people to salvation, um, they, God makes them willing to come to him. Mm. Um, and whoever God calls... Um, they will respond in a way uh, that is of following um, Christ, in a nutshell. Any other things? Perfect. 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 <laughs> Easy. Perfect. <laughs> perseverance of the saints. Yeah, I think, you know, uh, perseverance of the saints has to do with, uh, you know, the understanding that all that God saves, he will not lose. Mm -hmm. Um, and in that, there is great comfort and joy as well. Um, and if, if anybody wants to spew out um, some, some verses, uh, you, you're welcome to interrupt me. But um, before I do that, just getting into kind of the, the understanding of the doctrine of, of perseverance is, you know, you cannot lose your salvation. Uh, and it is, you are sealed by the Spirit. So we see that in Ephesians 1. Um, which I read earlier, and then later on, a couple verses later, it talks about how you've been sealed by the Spirit. And so um, mm -hmm. there's this seal upon you. No one is going to snatch you out of God's hand. So I'm kind of paraphrasing passages of Scripture as, as I go, but 
Um, none of those whom God has elected will be lost. And so it's a, once again, a very comforting yes. truth for us to think about as, uh, as believers and as Calvinists, because we know that the work that was accomplished, uh, he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion mm-hmm. at the day of Jesus Christ, as we read in Philippians chapter one. And so um, any, any other thoughts on perseverance? Perfect. Yeah, wow. that, that is such a... Man of a, many words there. That is such a comforting, <laughs> comforting thing. I was telling Drew earlier today, um, you know, when I first became aware of the doctrines of grace and first uh, had them taught to me actually here at Woodridge by, by Pastor Dave Mobley was my first uh, exposure to it. And um, just the idea that, I, you know, I knew I was saved. I knew I was saved by grace through faith that it was Jesus dying for my sins on the cross. Um, but I kept thinking that I had to do things to make God pleased with me, that I had to, that I could, that I could strain the relationship that I have with him. You know, uh, the, the thing I always compared it to when I would talk about it, it would be like, um, my daughter will always be my daughter, but she can do things that will really, really disappoint me and make me really, and maybe even really upset me. Um, but we 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 are se- we are secure mm-hmm. in our in our relationship with Christ, and that was such a freeing thing. And that brings me to you know just wondering: um, Have you guys always been Calvinists? Mm-hmm. I, I definitely had a. I've been a Christian now for fifty two years, and I, I've probably been a Calvinist for the last thirty of those. Mm-hmm. Um, what, what has been your experiences, guys? Yeah, I think, you know, I can, I can start. Um, <clears throat> I definitely wasn't. Um, I don't think these doctrines were really emphasized either way in our home growing up. It was, um, grew up in a wonderful Christian family with wonderful godly parents. And so, um, but it wasn't until I was out of the house and in college and, um, my older brother had given me a book, uh, a systematic theology book condensed into this Bible doctrine uh, book by Wayne Grudem. And that's really what was my first introduction to even some of these words. Grudem systematic theology. It was, yeah, yeah. the the Bible doctrine version edited by Jeff Perswell. And so it was, uh, we'll put that in the show notes too. But um, that was really my introduction to some of the stuff. And then meeting with a couple guys as we go through this systematic theology, kind of figuring out some of these doctrines. You know, I've I'd, I'd read my Bible my whole life, but it was really like the scriptures were finally coming alive. It's like, wow, like, this makes sense now. It makes sense. These words that, you know, yeah. I kind of just glossed over. I didn't know what they meant. Yeah. We're actually giving meaning. Uh, and so f- pretty much in my early 20s um, is when, you know, I would say 22 probably is when I started really um, going into these doctrines more right. deeply and, and kind of understanding them more. And it's just been a wonderful, wonderful, joyful journey since. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I was I was definitely not always a Calvinist. I I grew up um, and I I don't know if we've even brought up the the term yet Arminian, uh, but I grew up in kind of the Arminian realm, which um, in a nutshell is yeah, people a bit people that. often would say that's the opposite of Calvinism, right? And um, and so I don't know if we're going to get into that too much, but um, I grew up Arminian and was trained through Bible school in Arminian theology. And it wasn't until I graduated Bible school, I was 20 years old, I started coming to Woodridge, started serving uh, in a, in a, like an intern type role here at the church. And guess what? I had to share an office with Pastor Chuck Marshall and Pastor <laughs> Luke Dufek at the, at the time. And uh, if you don't know, they uh, they are very happy yes. Calvinists. Yeah. And so... Um, and they're talkers. And they're talkers. They're talkers. And, and so I... Uh, I, in my early 20s, I really had to start wrestling with um, these doctrines. And, and, and what I found, and I think this happens for a lot of people, is we, we come to Scripture with a lot of preconceived uh, notions or, or, or um, predetermined uh, frameworks that when we come to Scripture, we, we can read I can read as a Calvinist a passage of scripture and my Armenian friend can read the same exact passage and we're seeing those passages very differently because of these um, predetermined uh, sets of ideas and beliefs about uh, scripture and about God that we come to, to scripture with. And that's what I was doing. And, and what I began to realize and what actually helped me was not being convinced by 
the passages of Scripture surrounding Calvinism, but by the passages of Scripture surrounding the the character and the sovereignty and the and my understanding of who God was. Mm -hmm. And when I finally started to see that it is not about me, mm -hmm. everything from before the foundation of the world, when you go through scripture, everything that God does is for his glory, mm -hmm. for his glory, yes. for his glory, for his glory. And when I started to see that, all of, all of a sudden you, you read a passage and I'm like, well, if I'm going to read this passage for God's glory, I, I have to read it from the Calvinistic perspective. If I'm going to read it for man's glory, then I'm going to read it from the Arminian, Arminian perspective. And so that's a key element when we're... Th when we talk about the joy of Calvinism, our understanding of God is what produces joy in the midst of those doctrines yes. that we just talked about, total depravity, unconditional mm -hmm. election, right? We, you, you detract that from those doctrines and you suck the joy out of it, mm -hmm. right? Because our joy is anchored in a God who succeeds and he succeeds personally for us mm -hmm. and he will not fail and what he has began in us will be completed. And, and therefore, nothing can deter us mm -hmm. from uh, being, nothing can snatch us out of God's hands. That's and so right. yeah. I can be in any situation and I can have joy in God because of that reality. And so that's the reality that helps shift my mind. And so I've been a Calvinist for probably, I don't, I don't know, 15 years, mm -hmm. you know, 10, 15 years at this point. Um and loving it, taught on it, yeah, <laughs> joyful. joyful. Well, you know, it's fun for us here to see the change in you because yeah. we because we could see it, mm. and it was it was. He was just so see. lacked joy before. Yeah, he really was. He, he was really was. Such a, like, <laughs> Never wore sport person. coats. And, yeah, yeah. You know, he just wore those. <laughs> Is that does that come with Calvinism as yes, well? You got to wear the sport coat. So, no, well, I no. I have been <clears throat> I have been told that I dress more like a Presbyterian with all the sweaters that I wear. And That's so I right. need to upgrade to a Baptist jacket. <laughs> there we go. Told that. Right. Well, Matt, what, jacket. what about you? Were you, were you uh, always a Calvinist? Or? So I'll, I'll introduce a, a, a similar but a new word to the conversation. I have not always been a Calvinist, but I was always a monergist. And so I'll, I'll explain what I'm saying there. Uh, I grew up Lutheran, and Lutherans have uh, an understanding of predestination and an understanding that for all who come to faith, it is God acting alone to bring about that, that gift of faith. Mm -hmm. And so that's what, we, what is, is meant by monergism. Going back to the example of the person uh, drowning dead in the bottom of the ocean, uh, monergism says, yes, there's nothing within me that can grab a, a life preserver. I'm not just reaching my hand out and, and using my own capacities to latch on to the salvation mm -hmm. that, uh, that God is providing. I need him to do it. I need him to raise me to life. So at least the Lutheran synod that I grew up in uh, understands salvation in that monergistic way as opposed to a synergistic way, which would be the way in which uh, understands the nature of man as capable of, capable of grabbing, yeah, kind of, grabbing the, uh, right. the life vest or the life preserver. Uh, so I, I always had that monergistic understanding of how God works in salvation. Lutherans work that out a little bit differently, especially considering their sacramentology. Uh, but in my time as a regenerate saved person uh, in, my, in my early 20s since that happened, uh, I have been a Calvinist since that time. So uh, I would recognize, though I had a monergistic knowledge of how the, word, the Lord works in salvation throughout uh, my, my Lutheran years and my Lutheran upbringing, it was when I became a Christian in my early 20s that that coincided with my uh, uh, clinging in joy to the doctrines of grace as well. Yeah. Okay. Very, very good. Um, Matt, uh, Jans, you mentioned Arminianism. Mm -hmm. uh, let's just talk a little bit about that. And, uh, you know, like we did with Calvinism, let's kind of define that. Um, and because and, that's, that's, those seem to be the two competing viewpoints in the evangelical world. I'm not aware that there are others. Yeah, and I would say, you know, you, I mean, there's variations all across. So you have people <clears throat> extreme on one side, people extreme on the other side, and everyone, you know, everywhere in between. Um, I would say Arminianism is probably, if you look at the church today, it's the predominant uh, view held within the church uh, in, in America today. Um, 
and uh, anybody else can jump in and and give their input. But I I would say you know Arminius, Arminianism is the the man centered way of looking at salvation. And so when we look at when we look at each of these doctrines and and all of the doctrines that we went through, total depravity, unconditional election, the the doctrines of Calvinism are are a response to the doctrines right. that were brought to the church in, in earlier earlier in church history as um, uh, doctrines that this man Arminius was opposing the church with. And so so when you look at like total depravity, there's this total inability within man to choose God, right? And so so the the Arminian perspective is that there is still within us and this is where you get into like some of the discussion around free will and things like that. Yep. Uh, there is within us an ability. I chose Christ. Yes. What are you What are you telling me? I didn't choose Christ. And, I chose him. Yeah. And 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 there's a lot of variation with that because the the Calvinists would say that we, I would say that I chose Christ as well, mm -hmm. right? But I chose Christ because I was given the ability to choose Christ by <laughs> having my dead heart made alive, right? Yep. So there's there's little variations that can create a massive difference theologically, but, you know, that's one area with total depravity. Unconditional election, God does not choose before the foundation of the world those who uh, he will save. It's based off of his foreknowledge, I would say, is the most common uh, view of that. So he Arminian, foreknows. In yeah, in Arminianism, he foreknows, and his election is based on his foreknowledge of their choice. He knows what they're going to choose. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Limited atonement, you know, his, Christ died for all sinners. He, it's, the, it's the analogy uh, that we used earlier. He, he died, he cast the, the life preserver out, and now it's up to each individual to make the choice to grab hold of the life so preserver. it's unlimited now. And so it's unlimited right. in, in, in the fact that it's for all people. It's sitting there ready to, to be grabbed hold of, and it only becomes effective when you grab hold. Um, irresistible grace, you know, the 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 Arminian would say that we can resist. So when the Spirit is working in our heart uh, to give us a knowledge of the uh, glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, uh, the Arminian would say that we can feel the weight of that and still resist the Spirit in that. And and this Spirit is trying as hard as he can to 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 save us and to temp, uh, not tempt us to. Uh, um, uh, Coerce us, real yeah. assent. Yeah, and yeah. and 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 we can we can push against that. We can and we, resist yeah, it. We can resist um, it. and then perseverance of the saints. Now, a lot of Armenians would say you cannot lose your salvation; you can fall away, and so you're still saved, but you can live completely contrary to the gospel. Um, some Armenians would also go so far as to say you can lose your salvation, and so even in Arminianism, there's variation. I grew up n not believing you can lose your salvation, but that you can. You can pray a prayer one time, trust in Christ, and then 10 years down the road, completely walk away from Christ, never to return. And, well, they prayed a prayer 10 years ago, and they asked Jesus into their heart. They're, they're saved, they're right? They're saved. I, so, I heard him do it. Yeah, yeah, I was there. I heard him do it. That's Arminianism in a nutshell. Obviously, we want to talk more about Calvinism, I think, yeah. tonight. So if anybody else has any other other thoughts on that, um, go I think for we it. we kind of hit, hit the big one. It's, it's a... Um, we kind of talked about this a little bit before, but just more of a, a smaller view of God and his abilities and, and his glory and more of a man-centered yeah. view of God because the Spirit can't overcome my will. Uh, you know, all these other things that kind of go hand in hand well, with, with some of those Yeah, things. and if you're so, paying attention to the descriptions I, I gave under each of the, you know, TULIP acronym, it's it's all a man-centered. So total depravity, the Calvinists would say we have no ability with it. Well, the, the Armenian would say, well, yeah, I, have a, I have ability within myself, right? It's, it's a man center. I want, I want some of the glory. Mm -hmm. Unconditional election, limited atonement. Like, you go down the list, and it's, and it's all the difference is, am, is God the, the hero here, or am I? And now, you talk to an Armenian, and you say, you kind of make yourself to be the hero, and they say, no, God's the hero, right? But, but when you unpack the theology, I think— you can see the subtleties there where um, there is credit being given in some way, shape, or form to the Arminian in, in their active role in salvation. Yeah, and I think we want to be uh, gracious. There are people who would 
identify as Arminian, either explicitly or implicitly, and they are uh, very faithful brothers and sisters in Christ. Absolutely. Some who uh, will know the Bible more than all four of us, right. you know, put uh, at this table put together. Right. And uh, so this isn't uh, in inside the camp versus outside of the uh-huh. camp uh, kind of thing. But to that point, uh, it, it does engender some discussion and and when it comes to this idea of whether it's the hero or a, a low view of God or a little view of God, um, uh, to be fair to Arminians, I think some of them will say God in his sovereignty has uh, chosen to allow man in his free will to to exercise that as an act of love. And my retort to that would just be that in the giving up of that, We have turned from a cosmic worldview where God's will is ultimately um, uh, responsible for uh, for what comes to pass, and and man's will then becomes the kind of uh, ultimate factor of the universe Mm -hmm. to the extent where you get to the end of time, and because God has given up in His sovereignty this this particular way in the Arminian worldview, um, at the end of time, is God disappointed that things didn't turn out better? Does God say, aw shucks, at the end of time, like, I had such big plans for this world, but they just, they just would not come? Or does God, in his own godness and in his own joy in being God, say, I accomplished all I set out to accomplish? And it's, it's in that rub that I, I find a very strong argument for Calvinism that uh, we worship the, the God who at the end of time uh, has uh, no regrets and has triumphed in the way that he has set out to triumph versus uh, a, a God who looks over time and just says, but if only it would have been a little different. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 And I think that that, that kind of brings us kind of full circle with this concept of of joyful or happy Calvinism is that we can, we can be joyful in all circumstances because we know that we don't have to be in control. We don't have to, we, we, we see over and over in scripture, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces these things, endurance, perseverance, faithfulness, all that. Uh, There, there, we come to circumstances in our life. We don't know what's happening. We don't know why it's happening. And yet there is this immense joy that the Christian can experience knowing this is 100% within God's control. And I think, I think if we, you know, if we go around the board, we can all talk about some very significant struggles of loss or, or hardship or, or whatever it may be that we've experienced in life. And yet the unwavering reality that God is at the center of everything, whether it's our salvation, which is key, um, or the events that take place within our very lives, knowing that God is in control. And, and uh, we haven't even talked about the books, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a plug for this one here, The Joy of Another Calvinism. Commercial. <laughs> by uh, Greg Forster. Um, I read this. I think all of us have probably read this at some point uh, throughout our lives. But um, in the very end of the book, he he kind of in his conclusion, he, he writes um, uh, and he's quoting uh, a pastor that he heard preaching on on the concept of biblical joy. But this pastor says joy is not an emotion. Joy is a settled certainty mm. that God is in control. Yeah. Right. Amen. And and what do we look at when we look at Calvinism and the 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 TULIP acronym, total depravity? What do we see there? We see God is in control in every aspect of our salvation, and we as as Calvinists can can throw that out to every aspect of our lives. Mm. There's not a there's not a single area of life, single realm. We think about the things going on with politics right now or in our culture. There's not a single realm that God is not in control, and that produces joy. It produces joy. It makes us joyful Calvinists. I like that a lot better than happy Calvinists. <clears throat> yeah. It's deeper. It's richer. You know. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> well, gentlemen, we are uh, 
kind of at the end of our time, unless anybody had, does anybody have? Uh, you know, oh, we've got burning, plenty more to uh, say. A burning thought they want to. Look at these post-it notes. Oh, I didn't even get to the lasagna over. comment. Well, we'll, <laughs> you got a lasagna Layers recipe there, don't you? something <laughs> like that. Um, no, we'll, we can come back to this. That's the nice thing about having our own podcast. But I will, we can do whatever we want. I won't go lasagna, but I will go Spurgeon. Uh, Spurgeon said, the doctrines of grace are good, but the grace of the doctrines is better still. And so when we're talking about joyful Calvinism, mm. um, I, I think that's where we can both rest and recognize where things go off the rails, is that people uh, get bogged down in the systematics and yes. in the doctrine. Uh, which is important. A, which is important. Yes. Um, but, okay, I'm going to get to lasagna. So, okay. When, <laughs> it's like lasagna is a big, beautiful, <laughs> delicious thing. And if you just read a recipe... Unless it's got like, too much cheese in it. Oh, then it's horrid. Repent. Disagree, but go ahead. Yes. Repent. We're in Wisconsin, John. <laughs> if you're just looking at a recipe for lasagna, you miss some of the grandeur mm. and the glory of lasagna because mm. the grandeur and the glory of lasagna is in its smell and in its taste and in the way you get to enjoy it with your family and your friends. And so when we're talking about the doctrines of grace versus the grace of the doctrines, we can't get bogged down in just like reducing it to a systematic recipe when the recipe was given for us to have this big, beautiful, glorious display of all that God has done to allow us to enter into the joy that he has within himself. Mm. One of the craziest verses that I still want to get to the end and, and have God explain it to me is how in Second Peter he says, uh, all of this, these great acts of salvation uh, occur that we might become partakers of the divine nature. Yes. So God from all eternity past, eternally happy within himself, decides to create and decides to redeem in order to let other people into that ultimate joy that he has. And if you're just recipeing it systematically on a, a piece of paper, you could lose out on the joy yes, or you could right. follow it all the way to the end mm -hmm. and and enjoy the 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 yield of that recipe and that yield of the recipe is what is going to fuel us as Christians. And, and, and we can point each other to it. Mm. He enjoy this lasagna with me, brother, enjoy this lasagna yes. with me, sister. This is what God has done and he will not fail because that's not what he's about. That's I think fine. your, uh, your reformed, uh, coffee people need to come out with a reformed a lasagna. lasagna after I don't think one. we're ever going to eat lasagna the same way <laughs> ever, ever again. Well, gentlemen, this, this has been wonderful. Uh, we'll, we'll have to do this again to revisit it because there still is so much that we can, that we dipped can our toes through. in the water, <laughs> dipped right? our toes in yeah. the water just a little bit. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Thanks you all for being here. And thank you to all of you for tuning in today. Uh, send us your questions or your comments. If you have uh, things that you want to ask us about or comments about the podcast uh, or, or future episodes to suggest. You can email us at treasurecast at woodridge.cc and uh, we'll, we'll see what we can do with those. Uh, rate our podcast on Apple and Spotify. Smash the like button. Tell your friends. And uh, we'll, we'll look forward to seeing you next time. Right. Thanks very much for being here today. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Treasure Cast. The Treasure Cast aims to support the church as we glorify God by proclaiming the gospel, making disciples, and treasuring Christ above all. If you found this episode helpful, please share it with any friends or family you think would enjoy it and follow the show on your preferred podcast platform. If you would like more information about our ministry, please visit woodridge.cc. Go and treasure Christ above all today.